Hello, and welcome to Thick as Thieves. I'm Veronica. And I'm Sarah. We are two criminal defense investigators with pasts in art history. When I say pasts, I mean pasts, <laughs> not paths. It sounded really weird right then. Anyway, art history nerds who work in criminal defense. So we intersected the two of them to create this podcast for all of you. It's the intersection of art and crime and how those things happen and what are the consequences. And we just sort of chit chat about the artists and what happened and what kind of punitive measures were taken and what is the value of art after something like that happens, et cetera, et cetera. Punitive measures. Yeah, I don't know. I think, I don't know why the term just came out, but it's there. (laughs) Yeah, so we are a couple episodes into season two. Yeah. All right, so you're presenting today. You, Sarah. Hello. What are you presenting on? So, this week we are going to talk about a painting by Barnett Newman. And this is this is a slasher podcast today. This is so the painting is called Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue? Three. And <laughs> she lifted her hand up like with three fingers. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's like four or five of them, maybe four. Um, but it's the third one. That's a real kicker. This this third painting has just had such a life, such a tragic story, <laughs> and it's amazing because it just kind of keeps going. Like the painting just keeps getting um, fucked with to a point where like it's almost like humorous to me. <laughs> right. Um, let's back up a bit and let's talk about the painting itself. So yeah. okay, so this is a 1967 painting by Barnett Newman. So if you don't know who Barnett Newman is, he was, so he's kind of one of the spokespeople for abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. Um, He didn't get started painting until he was like 45. So he was like a substitute teacher. He was really into art. He was doing a lot of art stuff and um, working like in galleries and things and had a lot of artist friends, but he didn't actually get started in painting until later in life. And most of his paintings are abstract paintings. Yeah. Um, typically, like, you know, color-filled paintings, like these large, large canvases that are typically one or two or three colors. Um, usually, you know, well, I want to say a lot of times it's primary colors, but that might not even necessarily be true. I think there's all kinds the of The classic colors. abstract expressionist look, though. Mm-hmm. Which I feel like it'd be so intimidating to choose to become an abstract expressionist when it, you know, during that time of abstract expressionism. Why? I, it feels like I would, I feel like if I were in living in New York during that time and I was a painter and then I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this abstract expressionism thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like I'd be copying other people or I don't know, maybe I... But isn't that the it nature seems of challenging? Movement? I mean, if if there's any movement, like it's going to be like, oh, you're all kind of. I guess it's just like, how do you become distinct within that? You know, I felt like that movement was definitely dominated by dudes, so that seemed to be a big part of it. Mm-hmm. It's a very like masculine art movement, and then it was so commercialized. And there are people that I love from that. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Rothko, but I also kind of feel like if I. <laughs> Like, I don't know, you know, Nancy Spiro and Leon Golub, mm-hmm. they were making art around that time, but they were making figurative art. And they were really just kind of like booted out of New York because they leaned towards that. Mm-hmm. And it was so, so I felt like abstract expressionism was so dominating Yeah, in a way that like you either you were, fight or, or flight out. response, you know, like, yeah. do you want to join this or not? And if you don't, then goodbye. Good luck out there. Yeah. There's something oppressive feeling about it. Mm-hmm. I can understand that. Yeah. For sure. And I mean, it, yeah, I think it was... A very masculine field. There were some really great, uh, like Helen Frankenthaler and some other ones who were who were up in there, like females who were doing it too. Yeah, but for the most part, yeah, it very was dude centric. Very dude centric. Um, so Barnett, one of the <laughs> one of the main reasons why I have this odd fondness for Barnett Newman is because when I was in college or something, there was this documentary that I had on DVD called "Who Gets to Call It Art," or mm-hmm. and it was a documentary about pop art mm. and kind of New York in the like 40s, 50s, and 60s. 
And Barnett Newman is in it a lot, and it's his. Vo- he has this really great voice. Mm-hmm. Like when he says things, I just like hearing him talk a whole lot. Yeah, and it's kind of hard to explain, but he has a sort of draw, this kind of languid way of speaking that's mm-hmm. like very comforting. And I just remember him so well from that documentary. I, I don't even think they showed his very much of his artwork in that documentary. He was just talking over and like narrating the story of kind of how New York was operating in I want to watch that it's it's really good I have not ever it's not on Netflix I haven't seen it like I just had this I bet it's at a library surely let's see yeah National Public Library is pretty good they have a great well, I'm gonna make sure that that's even the title what's the title again who gets to call it art and it's from like the 80s or something no no I well think I guess in the 2000s if his but if his voice is there mm-hmm. he died in like 1970 oh, so yeah I mean it's not like he was yeah, <laughs> doing the documentary. They just had clips of him talking from a okay, lecture right. or something. I don't know why my brain is yeah, suddenly so this, thinking. So this is the cover of it. Oh, yeah, that looks really familiar. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen Who's it. Who's the man at the top of that? Ew, I don't know. There's like a little... Oh, it's... um. What is his name? Henry Gelfeller. Gelfeller. Oh. My 2006 self would be so sad that I don't know this. Geldzoller. Okay. Yeah, so Henry Geldzoller was, like, the big patron of Warhol and Basquiat and those people. Mm-hmm. And he, like, weird dude who was a curator. Can and I see that again? See what? The image? The poster or whatever? I just want to look at how he looks as, like, a little cartoon character riding on a mountain of <laughs> art. What is he holding? Is that a cigar? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And this but was for kids? A- no. Oh, this is for everybody. Okay. Yeah. It's just a re- it's a really good art documentary that I just I've never seen it anywhere else and I've never heard anybody talk about it but I used to watch it all the time I've seen it I watched it probably like forty times is that this image of the guys wearing sunglasses is that the Ramones no oh, I've not I've, I just haven't studied this cover no but there's Andy Warhol there's Jasper Johns painting there's Roy Lichtenstein there's I see JFK look that's JFK okay we got some JFK I we got think- Pollock. We got Pollock down there. Anyways, mm. for anyone who wants to like watch a good art documentary, that's a great one. I-, I recall Barnett Newman from this documentary. And he kind of made a lot happen in the art world. And then he did his own paintings. Um, when you say he made a lot happen, what do you mean exactly? Like? I think he was just, he he supported a lot of people and like tra- got shows together and was just very involved in the art community in New York. So he wasn't like, an isolated artist who had, you know, like a cabin in like Maine or something like Mm. that. You know, I mean, he was, he was very much a socialite and part of the whole scene. Hmm. The painting that we're going to talk about today is called, it was, it's one of his later works. And so he died in 1970. This was done in 1967. Mm -hmm. So he was 65 when he died. Look at Barnett Newman. Look at this photo of him. Oh, with it's his little a mustache. He looks cutie. Like <laughs> He's wearing a bolo and a bow tie. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Hey, if you can't choose, just wear them both. All right. Um, I'm going to do that on New Year's. <laughs> so, so this painting was on display at the Stedelijk Museum. So it's a huge, huge painting that is the majority of it is this really, really, really deep, vibrant red. I mean, just like... In your face, red. And then on the left side, all the way to the far left, there's this like little blue stripe. And then all the way on the far right, there's an even smaller yellow stripe. Mm -hmm. Oh, aren't those called zips? Yes. Yeah. So so he calls them. So all of his paintings are, you know, basically just large swaths of colors and then stripes. But you definitely can't call them stripes when you're referring to his paintings. He calls them zips. I like it. zips. I think it's cute. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm totally into it. That's one of the most, that's what I remember about him the most is his use of the term zip. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So in 1986, the painting's on display in this museum. And this guy comes in and with a little knife comes in and just slashes it. Like a pocket knife? Basically, yeah. Mm. Comes in, into the museum, slashes it all up, and when you have a painting that's this big and just one color, mm-hmm. like, when you put slashes in it, it just completely... I mean, it, it's so jarring in terms of, like, how much it just destroys this canvas. Because the whole idea is just it being this kind of enveloping sea of color, right? So someone comes in and slashes it, and it's just, like... 
it's destroyed. Right. Um, How many slashes? It was eight slashes, I okay. think. My first question was like, why? Like, what about this painting would make someone come in and like just feel so much? So mm-hmm. when the so when the Steel Lake Museum acquired this painting, it was extremely controversial. They got it in 1969, mm-hmm. and at the time, abstraction was still confusing. Well, mm-hmm. You know, like you put this in a museum, and there were just a lot of people that were Maybe. that did the whole, you know, like what I could do this, I could do this, blah, 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 you know, like what is this? What is, um, I mean, it's very nature, all abstraction is confusing all the time in a way, right? We just make sense out of it, yeah. But it seemed to garner this very visceral reaction from people, okay. This um, particular painting or just abstraction in general, I think this particular painting was a like poster child, you know, for the movie. I mean, it it just, people were directing a lot of their anger at, I think, the whole movement mm-hmm. towards this painting in particular and a couple of his other ones that were on display. So there was a lot of the, like, anyone can do this. Mm-hmm. Why is this art? Such and such. So in 1986, this painting is put into an exhibition called The Grand Parade. And it's a pretty big exhibition. The whole idea of this exhibition is to ask what a painting is or isn't. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole idea. During the course of that exhibition, this painting, it gets back into the light of controversy. So the guy who did the slashing is someone named Hiryard, Hiryard? Jan von Bladren. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. One day we're going to get executed for all our... (laughs) Hiryard, Jan von Bladren. Mispronouncing. (laughs) Um, Hiryard. So, this guy, he's 31-year-old, unemployed bro living in his mama's basement. Oh, that recurring theme. (laughs) The media refers to him as, like, a mentally disturbed realist painter, (laughs) which I think is... I I don't... I haven't seen his art. I don't know what his art actually looks like, but he... The whole idea is that he's known for, like, rejecting abstract art. He he likes realism. He likes paintings of things that you can understand, and you can say, this is a landscape. This is a barn. This is a naked woman. This is a thing. Like, he really, really, really... I like the... Landscape barn a naked woman? Yeah. (laughs) Because that's what I think of when I think of realism. (laughs) Um, So, he claims that he is doing this as, like, a political, you know, statement or an art, art, a statement about art. Mm Mm-hmm. He goes in, he slashes the painting, and he's arrested, and he gets five months in jail, which he serves. What he is it, what's the charge? Um, I'm not sure what the charge is. It's probably vandalism or destruction of art, but all it says is that he was arrested and sentenced to five months in jail. He gets out of jail, goes about his business. The museum then is tasked with restoring this painting. It's such an important painting to them, and they want to get it back to its original state. So typically, if it were to have happened to any other work of art that's not just like a giant field of painting, yeah, the restoration process is it's not simple, but it's doable. Yeah, because right? it's kind of camouflage. And especially slicing. So if you take a knife... And so I worked in a conservation lab for a while, and mm-hmm. we had some slashings come through our door. Whoa. And it's not that hard to fix them. Like accidental or on purpose? On purpose, sure, yeah. God, this is really a thing. People really like to slash paintings. This was done by a child. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, wonder, I, mean, I wonder where I that I mean, it was on done. purpose, but I don't know, like, you know, I don't know if he really knew what he was doing. He wasn't sent to jail. We yeah, know that much. So they are starting to look into options on how to restore this. They know it's going to be a big task because it's not. It's going to have to be done so carefully to not see any scars, right? Right. I mean, because if you've got a really busy painting and you very carefully stitch up all of the slashes and put it all back together, you can kind of it can blend in to a point where like probably most people won't notice mm-hmm. it. But when it's this giant field of red, good luck making it not noticeable. So they know that this is a big task. All also, while they're kind of worried about getting getting all this back on track, so many people in the Netherlands are like celebrating this, him, oh, celebrating the so slashing. it worked. Well, it worked for some people. So how are they celebrating it? They were writing letters to the museum. One letter said, "Quote: This so-called vandal should be made the director of modern museums. He did what hundreds of thousands of us would have liked to do." Said another one. Whoa. So I mean, people were really like they really hated this painting. 
And the idea of this, the fact that it even existed. And then another one of Barnett Newman's paintings in this series also got damaged because someone said it looked like a mockery of the German flag or like a, some like distortion of the German flag. Ooh. And so someone damaged that one. These paintings really kind of were on fire for a little while. It's weird the things that upset people. I know. I think so, too. Like, it's crazy to me that something that literally has no kind of inherent... It's innocuous. Yeah, no inherent meaning. I think it has to do with red. I think that red is actually, yeah. like, a very visceral color. And I think when it's that big and when it's that kind of in your face, I do think that we have some animalistic r- responses to certain things. Well, I mean, a lot of things come to mind when I think about the impact of red like Mm -hmm. I think of bullfighting you know that's clearly an example where red causes some kind of charge and and a literal charge and then I remember listening to it was probably radio lab or 99% invisible or something like that where they were talking about red I know it was the theory of everything did a whole episode on color and how red is very often chosen by you know sports teams if they choose the color red Mm -hmm. there's a theory that you'll win more games if you're wearing red so yeah i guess it just it's not a calming color no and i think but it makes you hungry right everyone's like don't paint your kitchen red or you're gonna get hungry all the time yeah i think that's the idea like red orange and yellow like that's why most fast food places like mcdonald's or wendy's or burger king like it's all yeah red orange or yellow and why they say like that if you want to eat less then you can eat on a blue plate (laughs) (laughs) are you serious Mm -hmm. because blue is if you want to eat less eat on a blue plate yeah whereas like a red plate or an orange plate or something warm colored it is like makes you hungry so Mm -hmm. the opposite makes you less hungry i lived in a house with a red kitchen and it didn't i don't know if it made me feel more (laughs) hungry you know i just felt like i didn't like the red in the kitchen because it just seemed felt like a dark you wanted to like charge your horns into the wall yeah I felt like a bull. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, it, you're probably right. It was the fact that it was this blazing red color that he used. I don't yeah, know I what exactly. If it was blue, red hue. if it was blue or like gray or something, I just cannot imagine that it would have this reaction from people. Mm-hmm. So they are trying to get this painting restored. So they end up going with why they go with this guy. I have no idea. Mm. It's this guy named Goldrayer, Daniel Goldrayer. And in 1991, the museum hires him. He's in New York. And I guess probably people pitched like bids for this job. And I don't know what his credentials were, but he somehow got the job. I'm getting the sense you don't like this person. Oh, no. No, especially not having, I mean, like, as a person who's who's worked in this field, like, this dude did everything wrong. Like, okay, I want to hear wrong it. That you can do. Okay, so first off, one of the main, like, rules of thumb or just, like, ethical things about conservatism, uh, conservatism, <laughs> that's definitely not yeah. what we're talking about, <laughs> conservation, <laughs> is um, <laughs> that everything that you do to a painting can be reversed. Yeah. So anything that a conservator does to repair a painting it can be undone and the painting can go back to its like completely original, even damaged state, right? Mm-hmm. So you never do anything permanent, ever. Yeah. And so all the paints that you use can be like removed, all of the like wax sutures that you put on it, all it can be melted down and removed. Everything can be undone. Mm-hmm. So that way, if a new technology comes along in the future or it needs to be kind of repaired. How long has that been a rule? For a very long time. Okay. Like hundreds of years? Maybe not hundreds of years, because people were really fucking stuff up back then. Yeah. But at least in the last, like, since since conservators started going to, like, college for it, and it became, like, a standardized Mm -hmm. field, which I'd say, like, so there's this woman, Carolyn Keck, who wrote kind of, like, the Bible of conservation, and she really kind of came up in, like, the 60s and 70s. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So that's really, I feel like, when it started to become, like... Hey, we have inter- industry standards. We're doing this a certain way. It's not just like random conservation people doing whatever they want. Right. So this gold rayer guy gets the painting and he has it for a long time. And the museum is wondering, you know, where is this? They give him, I think they pay him like $400,000 or something to restore this this painting. And they get it back from him. So the, it's, it's reaching the deadline. They're like, all right, bro, give it to us. Like, you've had enough time. Give us a painting. We paid you your money. So he sends it to the museum and is just like, here you go. Here's your beautiful artwork back. You're welcome. Give me my money. And they put it on display. And at first they're just like, cool. All right. And as it's up, people start noticing like, 
this kind of sucks. People are looking at it and they're just like, mm-mm. What are it's they just seeing the that's same. making them? It's just not the same. Something is just like not. It's not as beautiful. It's not as compelling. It's not any. There, there's just something very wrong with it. But so, not not immediately identifiable. No, it's just there's a luster. There's a soul. It's like about there's it. something off. There's something off. Mm-hmm. And so they put it through some tests. So you can take basically almost like x-rays of a painting and you can, mm. well you can look at the layers right so you can you can look through the different layers of paint and see where where the original paint was where new paint is all that kind of stuff you can see if you put it in certain x-rays mm-hmm. so they do that and what they realize when they put it in x-rays is that first off instead of just repairing where the slashes were Dude painted over the entire red block. And we're talking like a huge, like the majority of this canvas is red. He painted over all of that red. And Barnett Newman worked his canvases so well to the point where you really did not notice anything other than the color. That was Mm -hmm. the whole point is that it is so smooth and so silky and so buttery that like all you see is this red. Mm. Like you don't see brush strokes. You don't see... It's just this color. Right. And he spent a lot of time working his canvases. So they look at the layers and they realize like, okay, this entire thing has been painted over. The whole thing. And they look at what it's been painted with. It's an oil painting originally. He paints over it with just regular ass house paint. What? Just regular, normal house paint. I wonder which company he used. I have no idea. But he painted over it like numerous times. And so they get a little bit closer and they realize like in the blue zip and in the yellow zip, there are these little red paint splatters. So instead of the absolute perfection that Barnett Newman had, where, you know, the colors were just so um, pure. Yeah. Now there's these red specks. And so what they realize is that he just used a paint roller (laughs) to do all the red. And so it did the splattery thing. Right. Like Um, when you're painting your house. Yeah. And the texture. And so, you know, when you use a paint roller, it's like kind of textured or there's like yeah, bubbly, yeah, yeah. you know you can kind of see typically right that it's been done with a roller so they're looking at that and they're like oh my god <laughs> so they were like splattered zips yes yeah, splattered zips shitty house paint it just was not at all what it had originally been so the museum calls them out on it people start talking like it it kind of becomes an attack on gold ray or right like yeah and people are just like what has happened like you've destroyed this painting you've ruined it give us all our money back like we don't even know what we're going to do with this now. But what's crazy is that Gold Rayer, Ryer, Gold Rayer, filed a $120 million lawsuit against the city of Amsterdam and the museum for, like, tarnishing his reputation and won. What? Which is crazy. He had a really good lawyer. Yeah. So he, he got, got $120 million dollars for this crappy job that he did. I'm trying to remember... How much he got. He sued them for $125 million. I know that they had to pay, like, a million dollars for, like, the restoration and their all of their court costs against his lawsuit. I don't know if he won that money, but they had to stop talking about his work. So he basically got them to where they could never say anything about his Is restoration. Is he going to sue us right now for talking about his shitty care. job? Sue me, Goldberg. He's probably Sue dead. us. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Trump type. Yeah, it's yeah. terrible. It's He's like, like the he did Donald a, he Trump. He did a of terrible job and did conservation. Not even, yeah, or conservator. Conservation. Yeah, conservation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he did a terrible job, never even owned up to it. But what ended up happening was just that so they asked for a full report f- on the conservation, on what happened. And then after that, Gold Rayer and the city of Amsterdam just agreed to keep everything under wraps and not talk about it. That was part of the settlement. I need to look up how much how much money he actually if he got any money or if he just got them to not say bad things about him. Anymore. Okay, yeah, let's find out. That's interesting. So after all of that, so they get their painting back. It's not even the real painting. <laughs> yeah. And so about ten years later, around 1997, they have their painting back and they get a call. And on the phone is Hiryard von Jan von Bladrand. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to refer to him as Von Bladrin from now on. So it's the slasher guy. And he calls. He hears about the restoration. He hears what happened. He hears about, like, the botched job. And he's like, do I need to come in and do what I think I need to do? Can't remember Wait, if it's he a curator. Asked someone that? Mm-hmm. He calls the museum. And he, what is like, he referring I I, to? He needs to come slash it again. <laughs> so what do they say? Yeah? They said no. Of 
course oh, not. Because I mean, I would just be like, yeah, come back and slash this shit <laughs> after you spent that much money on it. I mean, I'd probably, yeah, I get it, I get it. But no, he's like, he calls and he's like, I think I know what I need to do. And the the museum staff is like, no, absolutely not. You do not need to do that. And he's like, you know what, I've got this, basically. And then hangs up. He then goes to the museum with his little box cutter in hand. Ten years later, after serving five months for already slashing this painting, Mm -hmm. he's back at it again. He's angry, and he goes back into the museum looking for this painting that's supposed to be on display. I imagine him, like, just traipsing through very angrily. I don't even know what this dude looks like, but I imagine him as, like, this stocky little... Like, what kind of shoes is he wearing? He's wearing, like, white tennis shoes to me. Oh, I immediately picture combat boots, but then I'm like, no, those are cool. Yeah, Yeah, no, he's wearing, like, white tennis shoes. He's wearing, like, Keds. Yeah. (laughs) White Keds. Yeah, like, he's he's really not a tough guy, but this is his moment of power. So he comes in, he's like, I'm going to re-slash this painting so they can... I don't even know what he thinks. I don't know what he thinks he's going to do. He's just not happy about any, any of this. Yeah. He walks into the museum and looks for the painting. It's not there. They put it up. I they, guess they're taking precautionary They me- knew it was coming, so they hit yeah. it. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe it just wasn't on display, but it's not there. So he just goes to the next Barnett Newman painting that he can find, which is this painting called Cathedra. And it's like a blue painting with a zip down the middle. A blue painting? Yeah. But this would go against the theory of eating on a blue plate. Well, I think he was just don't looking you think he for would whatever. See it and he would it would automatically calm him. No. no. I think this dude is already so like I think he had a bit up. of a limp wrist when he stabbed that one. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. But so he goes in and he slashes Cathedra. So he's got his little knife, slashes it seven times, and then when he's done, he just casually leans against the wall. He throws a couple of pamphlets or like a handful of these like pamphlets with incoherent ramblings of his in them. Mm-hmm. Throws these this like flurry of pamphlets on the floor, leans against the wall and just waits for police to come. Oh gosh. <laughs> his moment of glory where the pol- where like police arrest him for doing a thing that he's just so proud of himself for, I guess. Uh, he's the worst. Mm-hmm. I hate that type of person. Yeah. yeah. So he gets arrested again, and now there's another shitty slashed Barnett Newman painting. This time, they do not go back to Gold Rayer to yeah. do the restoration, which is excellent. They go to somebody else who, you know, does a better job at okay. this one, which one is would, great. I think, like, once Gold Rayer's done it, anyone's going to do a better job. I know, yeah. Like, I don't know how he ever got work again after that. Maybe he didn't. I bet he did. I don't know. There's something about those kind of disgusting characters in society. Somehow they do well. And that's sad truth. But yeah, they do. Yeah. I think it's pretty crazy that he was like going to go back in and do it again. Yeah. You mean Gold Rare? No. Oh, you mean? I think. No, and I'm talking about Gold Rare, though, even getting work Mm -hmm. after the incident that occurred. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. It's also possible that like people in America maybe didn't hear about it. Hmm. You know, I mean, I don't really know how strong, like, in 91, like, if, I don't know. I don't know what the... the internet wasn't, it was in its infancy, so, yeah, I guess and I feel we like didn't have Reddit. And I feel like if they were, if they were ordered have by law... Twitter. <laughs> yeah, if they were ordered by law to not say anything about it and not, and to keep it under wraps, like, maybe no one knew. Maybe Gold Rare went on to work and f- fuck up paintings just for years and years and years until he retired. Mm-hmm. And just destroyed things. I'd be curious to see what his, like, career looked like following that interesting so okay so there's like two newman paintings that have been slashed Mm -hmm. and then is there more no those are the two paintings that got slashed there by that guy Mm -hmm. i just think it's so interesting that like really the destruction happened by gold rayer like because he's the one who truly forever destroyed the painting yeah because the slashes are repairable like you can fix those you can I mean, not that anyone wants that to happen, but if you have a good conservator, you can repair that. You can fix it. You cannot repair putting house paint and a couple layers of varnishes, like, with a paint roller on a painting. Right. So I think it's funny that, like, the the person who intended to do the most damage actually didn't, really. Mm -hmm. And that the person who was trying to fix all the damage was the one who actually destroyed the painting. Mm. So they've, I think they put the painting on display, like, once or twice, but, like, it's just an ugly painting now. It just doesn't have the same 
luster. It doesn't have the same impact at all. I mean, it's all. Gold Rayer's painting now. I know, right? Yeah, they should just put his name on the Ugh. like placard, I guess. Right, and maybe not even his name, just like painting done by Gross Little Man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> gross Little Liar Man. Yeah. I think it's the story is funny because it just shows how important sort of what happens after Mm -hmm. something like this occurs. And I think sometimes museums just trust conservators to know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that could be very dangerous, I guess. Um, Now I think there's a lot more accountability and all that stuff. Yeah. But I don't know. I think I think that whole story is pretty, pretty incredible. That's crazy. And then, like, also the title. I go back to the title of the piece. He's afraid of um, red, yellow, and blue. Blue, which is like echoing "Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf?" Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Who, which echoes like "Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf?" Mm-hmm. And so yeah. it's a t- it's a title that beyond the color, the title also arouses some sort of reaction, right? And in this sure. case, it's like some kind of rage. So, and I think "Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf" came out right around. The, I mean, is that yeah, that Edward Albee? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It, yeah, his play was out. I've seen the movie, and it's really good. I think it's a Mike Nichols movie about a couple who are completely dysfunctional and horrible to each other. Um, <laughs> I used to watch it with my friend Sarah Moody. We would like watch it on Saturdays and when I lived in New Orleans pre Katrina mm-hmm. we would we had like a VHS of Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf that we watched as a, like a comfort movie when we were hungover <laughs> which is really weird when I think about that yeah. and I think I was the one that was like let's watch this movie the dialogue is just really smart though I just it's like kind of a compelling movie to watch it's like watching like Bergman movies that are about relationships mm-hmm. can you draw any kind of parallel between that movie like conceptually and a painting like this uh, or do you think he's just like referencing cultural titles and things like that I, knowing what I know of him there's got to be a like deep explanation yeah. behind it. But the title in itself is interesting because it's like "Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf?" and then that what? Why is that title even the title of the Albie play? Mm-hmm. You know, which the play, if it's like the movie, is not about Virginia Wolf at all. I suppose it's about feminism to a degree, but I need to watch it again to like really see how it would be in any way feminist because it doesn't really, it's in my opinion, not at all. Mm-hmm. Although I see Virginia Wolf as a feminist, I don't see that movie slash play as a feminist anything like it's the opposite essentially although i bet that's up for debate so i don't know maybe it's just he picked that title like i think at the time it was very popular to ask that question who's afraid of blah 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 right um to tap into people's insecurities or Mm -hmm. whatever well Um, so something that's making people uncomfortable is that in the trial the lawyer his lawyer argued like one of the main defenses what he said that like the provocation this work inevitably like called for like the artist was calling for an action Mm -hmm. and got one you know like that if it was asking a question in this title it was like meant to be emotionally provocative right so the lawyer's argument was like this artist wanted provocation and he got it for my client you know like that lawyer did a bang up job yeah yeah wait bang up means good right (laughs) yeah i think so (laughs) okay yeah but i can see how it could also be not good right (laughs) um Um, that's interesting yeah so I think that, I mean, we've talked a little bit about, like, how interesting it is when lawyers start to dig into what is essentially art theory and asking these very philosophical questions about what is art and what is art supposed to do? What's the job of art? And, you know, at what point is someone just reacting in a way that was called for, you know, or right. asked? I think that that's a whole, it's a very interesting question in terms of what is, what is legal and, and illegal in terms of art crime. Yeah, exactly. So I, I like that lawyers' defense in some ways. Also, at at the guy's second trial, he was... So after the second slashing, they were like, all right, dude, what's going on here? So at the second trial, he was declared mentally unfit and was sent to a psychiatric institution. Yeah. So, yeah, they were like, all right, clearly something's up here. You weren't just... Right. ...making a statement that first time. You're going to continue to do this, maybe. Yeah, maybe it won't be a painting next time. Totally. I mean, maybe just when you're a slasher... Yeah. (laughs) I feel like you've been slashing other things besides paintings in major museums Mm -hmm. yeah that kind of uh like using the knife as your tool your main tool to make a statement Mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's definitely gonna question the mental health of this person is he still alive i think so yeah maybe we could interview him let's get him on the phone yeah really dude first we need to figure out how to say his name properly i know (laughs) huron right 
Here yard? Oh, here yard. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the kind of name that you'd find in a Shakespeare play. Maybe. 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 Yeah. I don't know. It's just such a violent act and such a symbolic thing that it's it's an interesting way to interact with painting to me. Mm-hmm. And just that someone gets so riled up. Because it's not vandalism in a sort of, oh, I'm going to spray paint this thing or I'm just like destroying this. It's such a like mm-hmm. personal, I don't know, there's something about like slashing something that just seems very mm. personal and like vindictive and like it's a, an act of hatred in some way that is right. curious to me. I have a like kind of like dramatic fear of knives. Mm-hmm. And when I say dramatic... Like, I really didn't like knives when I was a kid. I thought they were so scary. I guess mm-hmm. I watched a scary movie and someone gets stabbed to death in it. And I was like, oh, man, knives are horrible. Yeah. Not that I, I didn't grow up with a skiing kind of family at all. But, like, friends of mine would go skiing sometimes. And I, when people were like, have you ever skied? I'd be like, I'm no, and I'm never going to <laughs> ski. And they're like, why? And I'm like, you're putting, like, two giant knives on your feet? Mm-hmm. You're just going to, like, stab yourself while you're going down a slippery, <laughs> icy hill. Like... That seems crazy. Skiing is, it's a terrifying sport. Yeah. I've not, only had bad experiences while skiing. I've done Maybe cross country and it's pretty mellow, but downhill skiing, not something I'll ever do. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that. I can die having never skied <laughs> downhill and think, be okay with that. Yeah. I think you can watch someone do it on TV and just get the whole idea of it. Yeah. Skiers are going to be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, you can't. Yeah. And we're losing all our skiing <laughs> listeners right now. Yes. They're uh, gone. They're like, unsubscribe. <laughs> um, sorry, guys. Not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. All yeah. Right. right. You can count on us to take you from one random place to another here at <laughs> Thick as Thieves. It's what we do. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Our theme music is by Patrick Damphier, and our artwork is by Saskia Kolges. And this podcast is brought to you by We Own This Town, Nashville's premier podcast facility. (laughs) Yep. Can you tell that we're completely unscripted? Because that's (laughs) the case. We Um, Own This Town is the best podcast network ever. All right. Good night. Good night. (laughs) You're probably listening to this at night. Yeah. Until next week. Which is weird because I'm looking outside and it's like a bright blue sky and my instinct to say good night. But that's... where my brain is at. Hey, Veronica. Good night. Good, good night, Sarah.